Well, hello everyone. I'm Peter Newman, the director of the Center for the Evaluation of Value and Risk in Health at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to our webinar today. Our webinar is entitled, Estimating the Value in Diagnosing and Treating Alzheimer's Disease, hosted by the USC Schaefer Center. So during today's webinar, our speakers will discuss the need for affordable Alzheimer's disease di diagnostic tests, the challenge of determining the size of treatment eligible populations, and how innovative payment models would help ensure the health system has the capacity and resources available to treat everyone. This is the third in a four part series on innovation in Alzheimer's disease. We have three truly outstanding speakers. Yifan Wei, Soren Matki, and Jakob Lavka. And following their presentations, we'll have a Q&A session. And audience members can submit questions at any time using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So let me introduce our speakers. First, you'll hear from Yifan Wei. She is a PhD student at the USC School of Pharmacy. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Soren Matke, Research Professor of Economics at USC. He's also the Director of the Center for Improving Chronic Illness Care at USC. And then we'll hear from Jakob Plavka, Research Assistant Professor of Health Policy and Management at the USC Price School of Public Policy. Jakob is also a fellow at the USC Schaefer Center. So before we get started with the presentations, we want to thank the National Institute of Aging, which made all of this research possible through their grant funding. So now let's jump to the presentations and without further ado, I will pass the mic over to Yifan. Yifan, over to you. Thank you. Today, I will present our work uh, estimating the number of patients eligible for disease-modifying therapies in Alzheimer's disease. This work is by Jakob, Jeffrey, Darius, and me. In this work, we estimated the potential size of treatment-eligible patient population for ADDMT in the U.S., and we considered the number of patients able to receive treatment given the specialist capacity constraints. I will first give some background of this work, introduce our estimation methods, and focus on our findings and takeaways. It is estimated that in 2021, 6.2 million Americans aged 65 and older are living with Alzheimer's disease. And by 2050, this number is expected to reach 12.7 million in the absence of disease-modifying therapies. Historically, treatments for Alzheimer's disease have provided symptomatic relief only. So the first disease-modifying therapy, Alduheim, was approved by the US FDA in June 2021, and many other disease-modifying drug candidates are in different stages of clinical trials, including zero late-stage biologics. Even though Alduheim has been considered a breakthrough, it is not yet clear how many patients will benefit from this introduction. Some of the potential hurdles to its use include concerns about efficacy, side effects, or costs. Yet, even if Aldoheim's uptake is limited, it is important to understand the potential size of patient population that may present for care for future disease modifying therapies in Alzheimer's disease as well. So in this study, we'll estimate the potential size of treatment-eligible patient population for ADDMT in the U.S. We will also estimate the number of patients receiving ADDMT prescriptions given the specialist capacity constraints. There are several important policy implications related to this study in terms of access, cost, and value of patient identification. Next, I will introduce our estimation methods with this treatment funnel. We start with an adult population age 51 and older. Then, based on inclusion criteria from the Aldohan trials, we select people with mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia. Next, we select those with a diagnosis among people with mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia. We treat this as a conservative estimation, and later we'll also report estimation numbers if we consider both those diagnosed and undiagnosed. And since many ADDMTs, including Aldohan, target amyloid beta, so we select those with amyloid beta confirmed diagnosis. This will be our estimated number of people eligible for ADDMTs. 
And for these eligible patients to receive treatment, they need to be seen by a neurology specialist regularly. So finally, to estimate the actual number of patients that will receive treatment, we apply the specialist capacity constraint and arrive at the number of patients seen by neurology specialists and receiving DMT prescriptions. Here, we'll show our estimated patient funnel. We break the result down by cognitive status and age group. First, for people with mild cognitive impairment, after applying diagnosis and analyzed as, uh, prevalence estimate, we project 1.6% of individuals under the age of 65 and 2.9% of individuals over the age of 65 may present for care. Using U.S. Census projections for 2022, we estimate a total of 2.67 million treatment-eligible Americans with mild cognitive impairment and immediately require specialist evaluation. This would increase up to 8.87 million if all patients with underlying illnesses presented for care. That is to say, if we include both the diagnosed and undiagnosed patients. Similarly, for patients with mild dementia, after applying diagnose and amyloid prevalence estimate, we project 0.1% of individuals under the age of 65 and 1.5% of individuals over the age of 65 may present for care. Using U.S. Census projections for 2022, we estimate that the total number of 979,000 treatment-eligible Americans with mild dementia due to AD and require immediate specialist evaluation. This would increase up to 1.92 million if all patients with underlying illnesses present for care. Next, we'll show results after applying the specialist capacity constraint. First, existing literature reported that 3.9 million dementia specialist visits would be available in 2022. We assume five initial visits during the first year, which includes two uh, visits for initial diagnosis and three visits for MRI evaluation. This would allow 780,000 patients to be screened and initiate therapy annually. However, due to additional follow-up visits required, this number would decrease afterwards to allow for both new and existing patients to receive adequate care. So here we consider a simplified demand model, which does not account for possible discontinuation of therapy. If we assume two follow-up visits in the second year, which is based on American Academy of Neurology and American Psychological Association guidelines, 48.6% patients would be seen by a specialist. And as the number of follow-up visits in the second year increases, lower proportion of eligible patients could be seen, as, in the, uh, as shown in the graph. So finally, I will show some important takeaways from our study. If we only consider those diagnosed, 3.7 million adults age 51 and older will be eligible for ADDMT in 2022 in the U.S. Breaking down by cognitive status, there will be 2.7 million people with mild cognitive impairment and 1 million people with mild dementia. Breaking down by age group, there will be 1 million people age 51 to 64 and 2.7 million people age 65 and above. If we consider all people with underlying illnesses, that means both those diagnosed and undiagnosed, 10.8 million adults age 51 and older will be eligible for DMT in 2022 in the U.S. It is important to consider specialist capacity constraint to get an estimate of people that will actually receive the treatment. About half of eligible and diagnosed patients could be seen by a specialist and receive treatment in the first five years, assuming five initial visits during the first year and two annual follow-up visits subsequently. If more follow-up visits are required, less eligible patients will be seen. That is all I have for today. I will hand it to Soren next. Thank you. Thank you, Yifan. And this actually fits nicely to uh, what I'm going to present today because um, like you've just heard, there are a lot of people um, that could be potentially treatment eligible for a disease modifying treatment. And the big bottleneck to identify and treat them is the number of specialty um, visits. I will rush through these slides rather quickly. It's a published paper and I just put the DOI into the chat. So if you want to read details, um, you can find it all there. So. The challenge is, like we've said, that there is um, a lot of prevalent cases that we have to diagnose. And later on, it gets easier if you only have to deal with the incident cases. But the prevalent cases will quickly overwhelm the number of available specialist visits. What we can do about it is we can 
triage people better at the primary care level so that not that many folks who don't end up having a treatment indication get referred and we can prioritize those that would actually benefit from a disease modifying treatment. And we are modeling this with a simulation. So this simulation has two interacting Markov models, a disease state model that tracks patient progression, and then a patient journey model that tracks their journey through the diagnostic process. And then we have an overlaid systems dynamics model that applies these capacity constraints to see how quickly could people um, be seen in, in specialty, specialty settings and then referred for treatment. Um, similarly to Yifang, we use the US population census estimates. We assume that manifest dementia can be detected at the primary care level and then have four different scenarios for patient evaluation with primary care. And I want to focus on the first one and the third one, which is brief cognitive exam prior to referral and brief cognitive exam followed by a blood-based biomarker for the amyloid pathology. And then we project cost utilization and wait times. So here's the most important slide. On the y-axis, you see the number of available specialty visits in the US. We actually have slightly lower numbers here. And on the x-axis, the time scale. And you can see here with um, the overlaying red and blue lines, which would be the mini mental test only or blood test only, you can see that um, the number of demanded visits is well above the number of available visits initially when a treatment became available and remains over that dotted line, which is the number of available visits for quite a while. If, however, you go from the mini mental test then um, to a blood test prior to referral, which is here your green line, you actually drop below the number of available visits within a few years, which means people could see a specialist um, without undue weight. The same is seen here in the average wait times, which is very, very high if you just use one of those tests like 50 months and up. And then here, if you combine tests, you see about a year initially and then quickly declining to um, a number of months. The important piece is that you can identify because you have lower wait times, a lot more patients per year on average. So we go up from about 500,000 for just a mini mental test to almost 700,000 per year if you combine the mini mental test with a blood test. And remarkably, the cost per correctly identified case declines from about 11,000 if you just do the mini mental to about 8,000 if you do the mini mental test followed by a blood test. So better yield at lower cost per case, that's usually what we look for in terms of value of a diagnostic. So our takeaways, if we can introduce a commercial test for the Alzheimer's pathology, and there's the first test now available, as many of you will know, we can improve access to a disease modifying treatment dramatically. And we have both an increased number of patients correctly identified for treatment and um, cost per correctly identified case declines. And you should combine the two tests because A, there's complementary information. Mini mental gives you reasonable suspicion of cognitive decline. The blood test gives you reasonable suspicion of the Alzheimer's pathology. But using only the blood-based test would lead to a lot of referrals without cognitive decline. And then they would require um, neurocognitive testing, not to mention the ethical question of what do I tell a patient without symptoms if they have the Alzheimer's pathology. Also, the sequence to do the blood test first is slightly worse in terms of the cost difference. So thank you very much. I'm taking, happy to take questions later and handing over to Jakob now. Thank you so much, Soren, and uh, really nice to be part of this uh, session. Um, I'll be presenting work uh, that uh, we now have actually under review and hope to publish in the next few weeks. 
on ensuring access to early stage uh, treatments for patients with uh, MCI or early, early AD. Um, this work has been uh, supported by NIA and uh, has been done with uh, my colleagues, Brian Tysinger, Jeffrey Yu, and Dara S. at the at USC. So um, I'll be talking about uh, the challenges that we face once um, these treatments are approved. And of course, we have the first one that has received accelerated approval, and we expect there will be many more, um, or hopefully, we, we hope we'll see many more in the coming months and years. Uh, but there are key challenges. So the first one is, um, especially when we look at the younger patients, we expect that the private payers uh, will find it challenging to cover access, uh, partly because they might uh, bear more of the cost, but less of the benefit. That is uh, due to the expected uh, long-term benefit of these treatments, um, even after patients uh, stop receiving their treatment. Um, that is especially relevant and urgent in patients under 65 who might not be on Medicare, but uh, might have the indication to receive these therapies. Uh, and simply said, commercial payers may find it economically not uh, beneficial to provide access because those patients would age into Medicare, for example. So it's a simplified uh, case, but those uh, patients are actually not all that rare. And uh, we may see challenges in that population. And that's also the population where the benefit could actually be quite high. The second challenge is, of course, uh, with the uncertainty about the benefit. Um, so from the trial that we saw uh, that that showed some results, some benefit for aducanumab. Uh, there was an about 18% reduction in cognitive decline and a 40% reduction in functional decline over about 18 months. But we don't really know if that benefit uh, will uh, be confirmed in follow-on trials. And also we don't really know uh, what magnitude of the benefit there will be after the 18 months. So there is now more work being done uh, by Biogen to con continue to collect data uh, for Eduhelm or Educanumab. And of course, um, there will be similar questions about future therapies that are just emerging. Uh, so based on these two facts, um, the starting point for our analysis is really to say that payers are understandably reluctant to provide access to these new therapies. And we hope that uh, this work might demonstrate what some of the solutions could look like. So what we do is uh, we use uh, the future elderly model to estimate the long-term health and economic effects of slowing decline in MCI and early 80 patients. Um, we apply different scenarios for effectiveness and we modify primarily the cognitive and functional decline because those are the ones that seem to, to be most relevant in the trial, but also seem to translate most directly into cost savings and uh, quality of life improvements. Um, we then look at what the social value and uh, value-based price um, would be uh, for each of these efficacy scenarios, and also we distinguish by age group. And then we estimate the net benefit or the net cost uh, to the payer uh, that is covering the cost of the therapy. Uh, we then also project the consequences uh, of alternative payment approaches, and I'll describe what those are in just a moment to both private and public payers. Um, in a simple term um, or simple way, we distinguish between private payers. Um, in this case, we just say everyone under 65 is covered by private payers, with, of course, that being a simplifying assumption, and over 65 by Medicare. And then we look at two innovative payment scenarios. One are constant installment payments um, that I will mention again in a second, and then pay for performance, so more variable installment payments. Um, so one thing that we see in the simulation is, um, I'll take it maybe one scenario at a time. In the top left corner, the first scenario is really what we see as the most optimistic, but also closest to the Biogen uh, result. So about a 20% cognitive uh, benefit and 40% functional benefit. And when we look at the different age groups uh, and the quality gains that are discounted quality gains, uh, we see that patients that are between 51 and 55 and then 56 and 60 years of age um, could potentially receive a benefit of over 0.5 qualities. Now, I should say right now that we assume a lifelong benefit. Um, the trials only lasted 18 months, and it's likely that there will be um, some convergence between the treated and 
uh, untreated populations. But in the best case scenario, we could see a gain of about 0.5 qualities uh, in those patient populations. In older patients, because they have less time to live um, and their quality of life might not be as high anymore, uh, the benefit is gradually getting smaller and smaller as they get treated later and later. Uh, but even for the oldest patients, uh, we see about a 0.3 quality gain in that scenario. So that is quite, um, quite a significant benefit. Uh, in scenario number two, where we just uh, reduce this by 50%, you can see that the benefits are also reduced roughly by 50%. And then we switch the directionality of the effects just to understand the dynamics. So we do a 40% cognitive and 20% functional benefit in scenario three. And then again, we reduce it by half in scenario four. Um, it's just to show the range of possible results. I will not be describing all of them uh, in detail, but even, even in the least um, optimistic scenario, we can see that there will be likely some quali uh, quality uh, benefit uh, to almost all patient populations if these treatment effects uh, play out to be correct in the real world. So the three payment models that we look at, one is the status quo um, kind of upfront payment approach. Uh, where we estimate that the cost of the treatment would be about 20% of the expected societal value. And we convert it from quality using a threshold of $150,000 per quality. And basically that 20% is what we see historically the manufacturer is able um, to capture as a share of the social value that the treatment generates. So of course, it could be a little bit higher for the first treatment if, if the price is higher, but we expect this would roughly become about 20% after it stabilizes. Then we look at constant installments. Uh, those are essentially estimated as still the 20% of the societal value, but we then distribute the 20% over the remaining lifetime of the patient. And we also allocate it to the commercial payer when it's under 65 or to the public or um, government payer when it's over 65. Uh, so we really take the overall value and we divide it by the number of years that are spent before the patient reaches 65 years of age and after they reach 65 and just allocate it proportionally. The third one um, is the pay for performance installment model, where we actually take the societal value, but we allocate it based on when the value is generated and then uh, apportion it to the payer that is covering the patient at the time. And partly because most of the value is generated after the age of 65 for even the youngest patients, most of the payment would also be um, expected from the public payer that covers the patient after the age of 65. So you can see the third one as the most complicated uh, when it comes to the transactions involved, but hopefully also most aligned in terms of the costs and the benefits of the treatment. So now we look at the net benefit that would accrue uh, by, by treatment effect. Um, in this case, I'm just showing uh, a 40% cognitive and 20% 20, 20 functional effect, but we could look at any of those. Um, and I show how it changes uh, by payment model. So here, uh, looking at the upfront payment model, we see that there are some patient populations, especially the younger patients, that have a net negative benefit or net loss potentially or net cost. Uh, that is due to the fact that the private payer would be expected to pay all of the value of the treatment upfront but wouldn't really recoup the costs, uh, the benefits um, over the lifetime of the patient. Uh, the public payer, in this case, simplified Medicare, uh, would be in the net positive, partly because um, Medicare would benefit from all that early investment and treatment of the patient. If we look at uh, the constant installments, uh, we can see that this story changes quite a bit, that even for the private payers, the net value, the net benefit is positive. Um, and so that suggests to us that the net, uh, that the private payers would be likely uh, to cover the treatment if, if the price and the value were right, partly because they would be expected to pay for only the share of the value that um, occurs before the age of 65. And uh, the, the gain that would be apportioned to them would be higher than the cost of the treatment. 
And finally, if we look at the pay for performance, um, the story changes a little bit, but not all that much. Um, so that gives us a little bit of confidence that even if we have constant installment payments, um, that we can solve this issue, especially for patients under the age of 65 years of age. Um, but it does increase uh, the net benefit to the private payers. So in a way, it could actually encourage them to provide access a little bit sooner. So just to conclude, uh, we see that under uh, the age of 65, uh, paying upfront could actually result in under provision of access to these uh, disease modifying therapies by private payers. And even if uh, these payment uh, models are really hard to implement, and we've seen uh, some reluctance to implement them in other indications in the past, um, AD therapies could actually uh, put enough pressure on payers to, to think very um, seriously about the solutions. Um, even these constant installment payment plans could mitigate some of the risk of free riding or under uh, provision of access. Um, the pay for performance uh, could help quite a bit if, if feasible. Of course, it would re require some outcome um, collection, which is always difficult. Um, but it also could be preferable uh, when the data on clinical benefit are not sufficient uh, to agree on the reimbursement amount at ex ante. So that to us suggests that if we don't have agreement, uh, having that pay for performance arrangement could be a little bit more beneficial to provide access um, to patients at all ages um, if these therapies are considered to be effective. So I'll finish here and I'm happy to um, discuss uh, any questions and I'll hand it back over to Peter. Well, thanks so much, all of you, uh, Ifan, Soren, and Jakob. Uh, let me remind the audience to please put your questions in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom. And um, perhaps I will start and uh, hopefully the questions will come in. I know there's one and I'll get to that one in a moment. But um, we heard about eligible populations and capacity constraints and blood-based biomarkers and innovative payment models. There's a lot um, on the table here. If I, maybe I'll start with you. Um, Talk a bit, if you would, about what's more realistic, uh, the diagnosis only or the people with underlying diseases. Speak to the, the policymakers out there. What would you tell them? So uh, in my presentation, uh, I talked about both our estimation for the diagnosed only and if we include both the diagnosed and undiagnosed uh, patient. So I think we, uh, we got our uh, diagnosis percentage in the mild cognitive impairment and mild dementia population from a nationally representative sample. It is the health and retirement study linked with Medicare claims. So we believe that the diagnosed only estimation is a valid estimate uh, for now. But I think it is also very important to consider uh, our estimates for both the diagnosed and undiagnosed because with treatment available, more and more people might be diagnosed uh, with cognitive impairment. We know that uh, currently the uh, diagnosed percentage is lower than the prevalence. So an important reason that physicians are reluctant to assign dementia diagnosis is due to the lack of treatment. Uh, with the current treatment uh, Aldohan available and some potential drug candidates uh, down the pipeline, there might be more and more uh, people diagnosed with this condition. So we think that in the long run, it is very important to consider the estimates with both diagnosed and undiagnosed as an like, upper limit if we are trying to uh, do policy evaluations uh, in this kind. You know, as you know, there's a lot of concern about uh, budgets, and uh, it seems like, from your estimates, there's a lot of uncertainty around these estimates. And maybe you could just speak to that for a moment. Um, is that true? Is uh, any prospects for trying to reduce that uncertainty in the future with better data, better analyses? Right. Yes. So I think there, uh, our estimates are. Uh, definitely, as you said, there are a lot of uh, uncertainties involved with it, and some of the numbers uh, we got from literature are, uh, I, I would say, like uh, quite crude numbers, but that's like the only uh, estimate uh, available that we can get. So I think uh, something that would be definitely helpful for our research and also uh, for uh, budget impact analysis or policy evaluation is to get more representative numbers like uh, the number we use for amyloid beta prevalence uh, in 
in like our uh, mild cognitive impairment and mild dementia population, uh, is we just got back from a single ritual resort. So if we want to reduce this uncertainty, it would be very helpful, uh, whether with uh, registry data or some uh, long-term maybe uh, observational study on the population level to uh, get those uh, meaningful numbers like amyloid beta prevalence, because those are uh, uh, what these CMTs are targeting. If we're able to get those numbers uh, more accurately, I think we are uh, able to reduce this uh, uncertainty in our estimation. Okay, thank you. So, Soren, let me turn to you. Um, I think you covered this, but maybe you can just help us a little bit more with the intuition. Why blood-based markers first and then cognitive tests? And why not just blood-based and why not the reverse? Cognitive test, then the blood test. It's actually that order. So the cognitive test first, then the blood test. So ah, okay. would only You're test right. for the Alzheimer's pathology in patients with at least some indication of cognitive decline. And the one argument is ethical that at the moment we do not have an indication to treat pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's disease. So we are somewhat in a difficult situation if we detect the Alzheimer's pathology in a patient with no symptoms because we, we basically give them a, a potentially dire prognosis, but say at the moment we cannot treat you. And then there's a slight cost um, advantage of doing the cognitive test first, but that strongly depends on the relative cost of um, the blood test compared to a um, evaluation in, in primary care settings. So that's a somewhat weaker argument than the ethical question. Okay, and, and where are we in terms of uh, actually having such tests available? What do you, what do you think? I mean, there's, there's the first commercially available test developed by a company called C2N. It's called Precivity um, that uses an algorithm combining an um, amyloid ratio with age and APOE status, which, as many of you will know, is a, a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. And that test is approved to um, sort of pr being predictive of amyloid status. It's not approved as a diagnostic, and it has the further downside that it gives you a high likelihood, a low likelihood, and then it's some indeterminate range. So it's, it's a step towards a test that you can actually use in the diagnostic process, but it's by no means perfect. Okay, let me remind the audience to put questions in the Q&A function. Um, and let me turn to you, uh, Jakob. First of all, there is a question um, about the quality gains. So I think you said it, but can you elaborate? Did your analysis capture, does it capture quality gains? We do capture quality gains uh, for the patient. We don't look at the caregiver partly because we use a healthcare perspective. And so we really want to understand how will the insurance plans look and be incentivized to provide access. Um, of course, if we wanted to look at a broader societal value um, with caregiver uh, quality gains, that would be appropriate, I think, uh, but would be a little more tricky to internalize from a commercial payer perspective. Um, and so we didn't look at the caregiver quality gains uh, in this case. As an aside, if I may, um, the gains from a Alzheimer's treatment applied in the symptomatic states has actually a relatively limited effect on, on caregiver qualities. And I put our paper in the chat. The reason is that cognitive decline in an early stages like MCI already implies substantial burden on the caregivers because those folks are by no means healthy. And the later increase in burden is somewhat offset by the fact that more and more of the later stage Alzheimer patients get institutionalized. So it's actually the burden is high, but not that much affected by an Alzheimer's treatment. So, Jakob, I wonder if you can talk uh, about feasibility. You touched upon this in the end, but we hear a lot about innovative payment models. And um, in practice, sometimes they uh, fall short or it's just too challenging to implement them. Uh, what do you, where do you think we are on this? How feasible, what do you think is likely? This is, I think, the holy grail in, in providing access. Uh, we see that uh, Medicare itself has said it will only cover patients who are enrolled in the clinical trials. Many commercial payers are kind of in a similar situation. 
Um, I think there is an argument to say this is a public good if we are able to uh, collect more outcomes data sooner than 2029 after we get the final uh, study results. And so I think uh, this could be a little bit of an argument for collaboration between the manufacturer, perhaps even the payers and the providers to say uh, we do need to collect outcomes in the real world. Um, that could be straightforward. We could use a CDR um, measure that already was uh, used in the clinical trial. And in that sense, if we are able to then compare perhaps the treated population and the untreated, maybe have some match controls, we could uh, basically estimate the implied value of these treatments in the real world. Otherwise, I think if we only wait until the clinical trials are over, we'll lose a lot of time. And a lot of patients, of course, don't have the time to wait until 2029 um, to receive access, full access to the therapies. So there's a huge, I think, a moral argument, but also an economic, a clinical argument uh, to say we need to invest in clinical outcome uh, collection and measurement uh, sooner. Uh, but we also may need some um, collaboration between those different stakeholders. And partly because it's a public good, um, I would also suggest that 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 role could be played much more strongly. Uh, by the government, because I think a lot of the individual stakeholders don't have the necessarily the financial incentive uh, to do it themselves. Can, can you think of any analogies to other diseases where we've had uh, payment models in, in a, a chronic disease that worked worked or provides lessons for Alzheimer's disease? I think Alzheimer's is one of the really the first big um, indications. A lot of the innovative contracts have, I think, to my knowledge, have happened in the rare disease world. Um, I think now in cancer, there are some of these contracts as well, where uh, based on the subpopulations and the, uh, the results of those patients, uh, there are some extra payments or discounts. Um, but I'm not aware, and maybe Peter, actually, that is something you might uh, be able to share. Uh, I'm not aware of a big indication like Alzheimer's uh, where this would be done successfully, partly because it takes a lot of time and effort to stand it up and may do it consistently and then resolve any uh, discrepancies. Uh, but partly because we haven't had a major uh, successful treatment like this uh, that would change uh, potentially a disease area overnight, uh, like we hope with these therapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't think of a good analogy to a, a major disease like this either, actually, and that's why I ask you the question, but I, I agree, cancer, rare diseases, we do see activity in another, and they may be there, I just um, don't, don't know of any offhand. So we are getting some questions from the audience, thanks for those, and let me turn to them. First, um, what is the best measure to calculate potential family member savings or excess costs of early detection? So, Soren, perhaps this is a question for you. I honestly don't know. <laughs> um, it's not an easy question because cost usually means medical cost, and it's rather predictable um, because it depends on your co-pays. Um, but in the context of Alzheimer's disease, it means nursing home because the vast majority of, if you will, bankable cost, real money changing hands, is uh, long-term care. Um, and that really depends on how wealthy you are in the first place, because very few people can even afford one year in a nursing home, and then the government takes over. So this is a really complicated question to answer, and I haven't really looked into that. Okay, anyone else there want to take a stab or move on if not? I, I might only add, uh, if, if we look at the informal costs, the productivity losses, for example, and Soren, you were making some argument about the nursing home, but I, I think there, there might be some value of delaying uh, dependency, for example. And so patients who are especially in the MCI stage, uh, we know that we can actually by Julie Zizimopoulos has done that study, that if we delay uh, the, uh, the disease by about five years, we can uh, expand, extend life expectancy, but also so shorten uh, the time in the severe disease state, um, partly because people die with other conditions or due to comorbid conditions. Um, but that uh, informal burden uh, of the caregivers, of the family members, uh, should be calculated, I think, for these interventions. But um, I, I think we can do it potentially with uh, FEM, but uh, we, could, we could discuss this offline if somebody wants to reach us uh, by email. Yeah. We have another question. Can an X-ray 
of the brain, I think it says, showed the same thing as a blood test. And Soren, again, I wonder if you could take this and you didn't talk about imaging and how that may play into any of these decisions around uh, diagnosis or uh, treatment of DMTs. Can you talk about that? Yeah, at the moment, you need um, confirmatory diagnosis of the Alzheimer's pathology, with, which is done with a so-called PET scan, which is an X-ray technology that basically shows accumulation of um, amyloid deposits in your brain. The alternative is a um, lumbar puncture to retrieve cerebral spinal fluid, and you can test for the um, amyloid deposits and other um, markers of the disease. So yes, you can do that, but a PET scan is really expensive and also capacity constrained, and a lumbar puncture is not necessarily the most pleasant experience. So having a blood test first would reduce the number of people that would undergo one, any of these confirmatory tests. Okay, thank you. Um, I wondered as I was listening to all three of you, if there's a uh, disparities kind of question here or issue that you might address. And I don't know to what extent you've thought about it, but I wonder you know, when I think about uh, eligibles or introducing new uh, blood tests or even perhaps payment models, um, if you might think about uh, implications for uh, disparities, could this potentially worsen? Do we need to do more, for example, Yifan, in, in digging into the data in terms of eligibles? Um, what, what do you think? Yifan, why don't I start with you? Yes, so I think the disparity issue you mentioned is uh, there are research uh, on this that uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease or dementia uh, might be more prevalent in uh, some minority groups like uh, African American or Hispanic, but the uh, diagnosed rate is like uh, lower in those minority groups. So um, that's I think a, a, some something is already noted in the. Ex existing literature and what's implications for research like uh, eligible population estimation and also like uh, uh, diagnostic uh, strategies like blood based I think for, for like my work is like because currently the uh, diagnostic number we are using are are from the existing data where the in, uh, minority group are underdiagnosed so these numbers might not be as accurate as we want them to be. And I think a second uh, like takeaway for all the research is we could conduct research looking into like some subpopulation analysis. So currently we are just focusing for like the US population on the whole, but uh, we could also uh, do subpopulation analysis to look at uh, some minority groups uh, specifically and what's the implication for them. And something, I think I would uh, turn to Sarn for that, but something I think uh, I know that for the diagnostic uh, test, uh, at, like the blood test, Sarn mentioned that uh, the first one approved, uh, precivity. I think uh, in terms of those, those clinical trials uh, might also be conducted in a not representative population. So maybe they are also like uh, lack of the minority groups. So like, uh, and we mentioned like they also include APOE like genetic information in their algorithm. And we know that those uh, like APOE, the prevalence are different in different uh, race and ethnicity groups. So I think it's also important that when we try to apply those technologies and make implications of them to be aware that whether they are tested on a representative sample. Okay, thank you. And how about you, Soren? I'm not sure um, how much yeah, you thought about this or... Absolutely, Peter. Absolutely. I mean, I think any diagnostic technology that allows us to at least pre-identify potentially eligible patients in primary care setting will do a great deal to reduce disparities, because we know that um, poor and more rural areas, and that, that's independent of ethnicity and race, just have worse access to specialist settings since they tend to be concentrated in cities. So to avoid either missing people or sending them 200 miles to the next um, memory clinic, primary care-based technology would be extremely important. And the blood test is clearly one of those technologies. There are also more um, uh, detailed digital cognitive tests that you can apply in primary care settings. So that could also reduce um, burden of travel and um, 
and access. And lastly, there are some um, payment policy issues that restrict access to dually eligible patients. But to hear more about this, you will have to listen to my presentation at AAIC. I won't give away the story right now. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jakob, any thoughts from you on this one? Um, I would only uh, highlight the concern with um, the privately insured and uh, the fact that many of the, say, poorer populations might have uh, less generous uh, coverage policies. And so the burden uh, that the payers might shift onto the patients might be higher um, and their ability to afford a co-pays um, could also be lower. Um, there's also associated costs, not just the treatment itself, but uh, the monitoring of side effects, such as the MRI um, that is expected at least, I think, three times in the first 12 months. Uh, and so that is, again, something that we see not only in terms of financial uh, constraints, but also people living close enough where they can go to receive um, those follow-up visits. Um, and safely uh, continue to receive that therapy. So I think there will be a lot of layers um, uh, where, where minorities or disadvantaged populations um, could suffer, but also hopefully Soren says some of these new technologies lot, like blood-based biomarkers could, could make the access a little bit easier. So we'll hopefully see some good, good uh, positive stories as well. Okay, thank you. And let me again remind the audience uh, questions in the Q&A function. Um, and while you're thinking of those, let me ask you this. I like to ask researchers a two-part question, and I'll ask this question, two-part question of each of you. One, what surprised you in your research, if anything? And two, what are you going to look at next, given the work you just did? And I guess, Soren, I'll start with you this time. Yeah, it wasn't really surprising. We had done some back of the envelope prior calculations that would show that um, adding a blood test to a cognitive test would actually reduce visits quite a bit. And so we mostly quantified what we knew rather than um, were surprised. And what about next question or step? Yeah, I think... The question is a bit more complicated than our simple binary um, memory test and blood test or vice versa, because um, what Yifan has shown is the diagnostic and therapeutic pathway is a lot more complicated, right? There are the MRI scans that we haven't incorporated. There are the follow-up visits. There are the side effects of treatment. And we haven't really um, looked into um, how better diagnostic technology could influence the entire pathway as opposed to just sort of the, the simple step of making a diagnosis. Did it surprise you that the degree to which the wait times went down or the capacity constraints were eliminated? A bit, yeah. I mean, it's it's quite striking that you go from wait times forever to almost no wait times until a few months. I mean, it's, it's probably not quite as rosy because we disregarded the follow-up treatment visits and whatnot. But yes, I think this effect is quite dramatic. And this is just sort of preliminary data from the first tests that could be commercially used. So better tests could even increase the specificity of, of the findings. Great. And, and Yifan, how about you? Uh, yeah, so what surprised me is uh, the final part I present. So after we apply the specialist capacity constraint, we find that under some reasonable uh, assumptions, only half of the patients uh, would be seen by a specialist and receive the prescription in the first five years. So I think that's really uh, that's something really important if we try to do like uh, budget impact analysis or uh, policy evaluations. It, it's not like all the people with a diagnose, uh, diagnosis would receive this uh, drug like instantly. And what some like follow-up analysis that we could do, I think, uh, especially in terms of today's uh, presentation, uh, is uh, if we are able to uh, take the benefit of blood-based tests or some other uh, these uh, diagnostic uh, technologies, uh, what would the impact be on the uh, like percentage of pop eligible population that could receive the treatment? How uh, so? Currently, we are saying that half of the patients would be seen in the first five years. If we use the like a performance of that uh, diagnostic test, uh, if we are able to identify those at a higher risk, how would we maybe increase that to a higher 
uh, proportion. So I think there there are definitely many uh, interesting follow ups to do, but I think that those are something really important. Okay, thank you. And how about you, Jakob? I'll just briefly mention that um, as an economist, I would expect the you know the the most advanced model, the pay for performance, to perform really exceptionally well. But then looking at the marginal benefit over the constant installments, where we would just make it simpler to administer such an innovative payment model, uh, one could argue that it probably is not worth having a very elaborate payment model in place. Um, so I think just seeing the results where we pretty much could solve um, the difficulty in providing access by private payers by having a simpler model in place, um, I think that was a little bit of a surprise, but um, it's, it's also reassuring because we know that it's very hard to implement these advanced payment models. Um, so some good news for work that is go going on um, uh, that already uh, in that vein, you know, we're looking at disparities and um, uh, Jeffrey Yu and Brian Tysinger are leading this work on the cost effectiveness in different subpopulations and the value of treatment in different subpopulations. So then we can actually look at some of the more specific questions about, say, Hispanics, non-Hispanics and so forth. OK, thank you. And a question came in. Is there a low cost survey instrument that has good correlation to the blood base and cognitive tests that were presented by Soren? So Soren, you have the MMSE followed by the blood test and anything else is a low cost survey instrument. Yeah, it's a good question. The, um, the challenge is that um, whatever test for cognitive function will correlate well with cognitive tests, like these new di um, digital biomarker tests, tend to have a fairly decent correlation with the mini mental, but and also with more advanced cognitive assessments. But they don't correlate well with the underlying pathology, right? because there are several reasons for cognitive decline. Um, Alzheimer's accounts for about half of them in early stages. And whatever cognitive tests you do, in particular in sort of low symptomatic patients, is not highly specific to the underlying etiology. That would be too much to ask of a cognitive instrument to also tell you, is this a squally of Parkinson's of um, uh, depression maybe or um, past stroke? versus Alzheimer's, you can't just sort of get that from um, interviewing and examining a patient. You really need to have sort of uh, PET scans, blood tests, and um, cerebral spinal fluid to determine what the exact etiology is. Let me end on a kind of a policy question. You know, we've all been through uh, Agilehelm. Uh, we've had the CMS uh, national coverage uh, decision. We're awaiting new trials. The diagnostic space is progressing and uh, extremely uh, interesting. So given your research, what would you tell policymakers at a high level? What is your big takeaway for them about you know, where we are, where we're going, and uh, what they should take away from your research? So uh, Yifan, I'll start with you. I think some takeaways from my research, uh, first, uh, it would be uh, uh, I think it is an important question, what is the eligible patient population is. And as our research show, it is important to consider uh, what happens in a real world scenario, like there are specialist comp uh, comp uh, capacity constraints that need to be uh, taken consider of when we are actually trying to estimate the budget impact of these new treatments. And the other thing is, uh, like uh, like I mentioned, some like policy takeaways are also the value of patient identification strategy. So if we are able to identify a patient at higher risk more accurately, uh, what would that impact be? And I think similar kinds of research uh, could be conducted to show the value of in th those investments, maybe the blood based tests or other technologies as well. Okay, thank you. And Soren? Yeah, I, I will give you an almost philosophical answer, Peter. I think as a society, we will need to think about how much money we are willing to invest in a um, aging and sort of early disabled population. Um, no matter how we tweak the payment models and the diagnostic technology, treating Alzheimer's disease and other um, 
neurodegenerative disorders that are particularly common in the elderly is going to be expensive. I mean, these diseases are very common. The treatments are complicated. The differential diagnosis is complex. So it will cost a lot of money no matter how we slice and dice it. And we really have to think, like, what are we willing to pay for that population that will not experience a large gain in quality just because their lifespan is sort of limiting um, the potential gains on the traditional measure of cost effectiveness. So this isn't really a question that analysts can answer. This is really more a question that um, policymakers and politicians have to answer. And of course, their voters, like how do we prioritize care for elderly as opposed to spending a fortune on oncology with often marginal gains? So very deep questions that have been brought to the surface by the aducanumab story. And I think those are still not answered. Okay, yes, excellent. Thank you. And um, Jakob? I'll maybe build a little bit on that. I just uh, returned from a few meetings in Europe and a lot of the complaints I heard is that um, that the budget for the healthcare spending and social spending are in isolation. But what we see in the US is even a higher level of complexity with many different stakeholders within the healthcare and the social sector. And um, what we, I think, will continue to see unless there is a, a policy reform or a, an inter intervention is uh, really suboptimal results. So even if we have the best treatment in the world, um, because of the fragmentation and, and the lack of incentives to really provide early diagnosis and then access to treatment, and then invest in all the non-drug interventions as well, uh, we will simply not achieve the best results unless there is much more of a concert, uh, concerted effort to uh, to find those patients, to provide them with the best therapy. And that can actually, as Soren mentioned, um, needs to be a bigger societal debate. I think uh, individual stakeholders can improve it on the margins. Um, but if we want to help people with dementia, the aging population, I think uh, we need to have a much bigger effort. Um, so I, I hope that that is a little bit of a call to action of all of us, uh, but also people on this call. Uh, because we need much more work to be done um, to make some progress. Great. And we did have a late breaking question about any, are any of you doing research on prevention, the prevention of this disease that you want to raise or highlight? I know that's a big topic and you're doing a lot of research, um, but anything there? No? Not, not personally, but there are several prevention trials in Alzheimer's going on that use exactly the same drugs that are currently being used in the early symptomatic stage. And we should see data probably next year. Um, of course, this is the logical question because in cardiovascular, where I'm coming from, we don't wait for heart attacks. We treat your statin, uh, we treat your cholesterol with statins way before um, you get a heart attack or a stroke. And not to forget, um, there are several interventions that go for the risk factors of developing dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which happen to be exactly the same that get you heart attacks and strokes. And so there are also very interesting studies where that you can prevent onset of cognitive decline with statins and with other treatments. Great. And I think that will be the last word, but I just want to thank all of you um, in the audience for attending. And thanks especially to our uh, panelists, Yifan and Soren and, and Jakob. Uh, great work. Keep it up. Uh, we'll look forward to more in the future. So thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of the day.